Great, brilliant. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us uh, this evening. My name is Maria Adamson, and um, I'm just here for a very short introduction before I let you get on with your wonderful event. Um, I'm a co-director of CRED, which stands for Centre for Research in Equality and Diversity at Queen Mary University of London. And we warmly welcome everyone from hopefully all parts of the world and all time zones. Uh, we're here today, tonight, uh, to celebrate a book launch of wonderful Louise Ashley. And um, this is our uh, first uh, big event of the year at CRED. And thank you for registering. Um, we do hold events throughout the year. Uh, so please keep an eye on uh, any, any other events if you want to join. And I hope you have a, a wonderful evening uh, filled with uh, interesting discussion. I will now hand over to uh, Professor Kate Madison, who will chair this event, and she will tell you more about what is awaiting you. Thank you, Maria. And again, warm welcomes to everyone, um, to Queen Mary, to this webinar. Um, we're here to talk about Louise Ashley's groundbreaking, um, challenging and timely book, uh, Highly Discriminating, Why the City Isn't Fair and Diversity Doesn't Work. Um, just to say that we, I and we are delighted that Louise has recently joined Queen Mary as a senior lecturer in the School of Business and Management in CRED. And she's also a fellow of the Institute of Humanities, uh, the study of humanities and social sciences, which I'm currently the director of, and that's an interdisciplinary um, humanities and social science institute at Queen Mary. Um, reading Louise's book as an academic, I found it very striking because it's such a scholarly, um, such an empirically rich and uh, rigorous work. But um, I also have to say, as my colleague, Lizzie Barnes, who's also uh, here tonight, said to me yesterday, it's a gripping read. And academic books are, have many merits and often described in many ways, but page turner is not normally one of them. And she's right, it's a fabulous read. So I highly recommend it. Um, to those of you who haven't yet read it, you will thoroughly enjoy it, whilst also being dismayed by some of the findings that we will hear about today. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome our panelists. Um, joining us tonight, we have um, Sophie Pender, who is a solicitor, and she's also chair and founder member of the 93% Club, which rightly describes itself as the UK's least exclusive members club because it's uh, made up of um, all those who are educated in state schools. And of course, that's 93% of the population. Um, joining Sophie and Louise, I'm also delighted to welcome two Queen Mary alumna, um, Ariana uh, Avent and Nabila Naznin, uh, both of whom uh, graduated uh, relatively recently uh, from Queen Mary in the last five years or so. And, um, uh, working in uh, finance, and they are going to talk and share a bit of their experiences and perspectives. Um, so we are delighted to welcome Sophie to Queen Mary and to welcome back um, Ariana and Nabila. And I won't take up more time, so I will hand over first uh, to Louise um, and then to the others. And we will then have time for Q&As, and Lizzie Barnes is going to chair the Q&As, but if in the meantime you want to put anything in the Q&A as we go along, please feel free to do so um, as we speak. So I'll hand over to Louise. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great, nodding heads, thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction and thanks to everybody who is here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know how busy everybody is, so I definitely don't take that for granted. Um, what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is get, give um, hopefully quite a brief overview of some key themes in my book. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why the city isn't fair. And I'm going to try to explain how that explains why diversity doesn't always work as an equality agenda before picking up briefly on some themes that I didn't cover so much in the book, 
but which um, I would love to discuss. And after that, I'm going to bring it back to the sort of work that's being done by elite firms in this area to open up and um, diversify access for handing over to um, our fantastic panel. So we probably need to start with some brief facts and stats here. Um, obviously, my research focuses predominantly on the City of London. Um, I look at leading corporate law firms, for example, uh, where one study by the Bridge Group found that over 50% of partners are white male and privately educated. And of course, the latter compares to about 7% of the population. Um, another study also by the Bridge Group looked at leading financial service firms, and that found that about 90% of senior leaders were from the most privileged backgrounds in the UK, compared to about 30% of the UK population. Now, obviously, demographics uh, vary depending on where you look, um, and how and why those variations, variations happen is something I also try to explain in the book. Um, we'll also have quite different definitions about what we, how we define success in this area. But I think it's fair to say that despite quite a lot of effort apparently put into diversity and inclusion, the city has some distance still to travel. Now, to understand why diversity doesn't work, we need to know, first of all, why the city has never been fair and, in a sense, how it's got away with that. And the key theme that I focus on in the book is legitimacy. So uh, financial and professional elites make sums which are vastly above the average salary in the UK. And a great body of sociological research tells us that special rewards like these must appear legitimate to wider populations, in some sense at least, because if they don't, they come under threat. So the question is, how have city elites secured legitimacy? And one way they've done that is by cultivating a meritocratic reputation, which suggests that literally anybody with sufficient talent and the willingness to work hard can get in and get on. Now, that inclusive narrative was especially developed and deployed in the city following Big Bang during the 1980s. And it was used then, and it still is, um, to suggest that these kind of rapidly growing rewards were fairly allocated and justly deserved. Now, that meritocratic myth has always been quite shaky, but one function over several decades has been to help obscure the reality of highly exclusive recruitment and promotion practices. So the types of practices which have led to the figures with which I started. Those practices have often been unfair. They can be irrational in relation to talent. Uh, but one reason they persist is that exclusion offers the city's elite firms status. And status is an alternative source of legitimacy, which helps generate and justify high fees and very high pay. Now, there's a number of ways that works, but often we assume that the status of work is most obviously derived from its complexity. And the story here would go that complex work requires the most talented and qualified people. In turn, that talent is quite scarce and that makes it valuable. That is a key part of the meritocratic myth. And like all good stories, it contains elements of truth. However, one problem is that there is, in fact, no particularly good reason why just because skills are scarce, they should be particularly valuable if they don't contribute that much to the common good. So if COVID taught us anything, it probably should have taught us that. However, we also know that impressions of scarcity and thus exclusivity can be artificially engineered. And one way that elite financial and professional service firms have done that is to construct a phony war for talent by defining talent in extremely narrow terms and then fighting with each other to appoint particularly graduates from that relatively small group. We also know that the status of work relies quite heavily on the status of those typically associated with it. So occupations associated with white middle class men, generally, who tend to have the highest status social identities in our society, have historically enjoyed the highest status overall. And that's because those privileged white men lend their own status to the work that they do. Now, one important implication is that diversification can be dangerous for high status occupations. When those occupations experience pressures to diversify, which they do, this comes with perceived risks. And to complicate things a little bit further, those risks do differ depending on the particular area of work. And I probably don't have time to go into this, although I do in the book. Overall, though, that risk must be controlled. And that's exactly what we see. So when explaining why diversity agendas don't always work to drive meaningful change, legitimacy remains key. 
So I show that diversity agendas perform the same sleight of hand that I referenced above. They tend to do enough to secure an inclusive and meritocratic reputation as an intention, if not a reality, but not so much that they threaten to undermine the exclusivity, which helps secure status and in turn profitability. Now, again, there's a number of ways that happen, which I explain in much more detail in my book, in, in the book. But one is that historically, it's been possible to be different in the city, but depending on the job, only if you look, present, maybe even think more or less the same. Or, for example, if you adopt similar working patterns, as has always been the case. And one lawyer that I quote in my book said, basically, the dream scenario of elite firms is to do diversity without having to change very much at all. So the end result is that diversity agendas do do something, of course, but historically they haven't done all that much. There is plenty of evidence about what might, what might work better instead, and that would enable um, something closer to parity, perhaps, something that looks a bit more like genuine inclusion. That would really mean more radical structural and systemic changes to how these organisations work. So the sort of thing we know works here is to democratise organisations, to reduce hierarchy, to share power. Those sorts of changes are generally more effective in a societal backdrop, which is also more fair. However, those systemic and structural changes are not only difficult to affect, they also might not be that attractive to existing financial and professional elites. So in fact, what I argue is that a commitment to diversity offers an illusion of change without requiring those who currently have the most power to give much of that up. And in turn, that helps to protect and distract from the much wider inequalities of income and wealth in which these firms are often closely implicated, from which they benefit and which they help to create. So in a sense, they enable adjustments within a largely unfair system when real change would require fundamental changes to the system itself. And one thing I really mean here is actually a different model of capitalism. So I want to pause at that point, this point here, to underline a message that I also make in the book, which is that while exclusion has historically had a function, that's not quite the same thing as saying it's always been deliberately planned. So to a large extent, unfair practices have been locked in as a result of interactions between different organisations in the same field in the city. And that happens quite apart from any kind of conscious intention or will. In fact, much of what we see is kind of the result of internalised norms and cultural practices, which often go unnoticed because they're uh, taken for granted and therefore they're quite difficult to see. So it's absolutely not my intention to demonise the city, where I know from my research that many people are working incredibly hard to do the right thing, often in quite challenging circumstances. However, what I also believe is that individual passion can't always compete with institutional inertia. And one problem here is that in the short term, at least, the pursuit of equality is not always that closely aligned with economic efficiency and the, the aim of maximising profit. Now, I'm extremely aware that um, when presented in those terms, this message can seem very confrontational to those who feel most targeted by it, in other words, financial and professional elites. Um, one thing I didn't write about in my book so much is how that message is received by them. I am fortunate to be invited to give talks in the city relatively often, um, and I must admit that sometimes I'm confronted with rather stony messages when I, when I make a similar kind of talk, and I know that this message can be difficult to take. In fact, I am sometimes advised to dilute my message to make it more palatable to those groups. And I do understand that. But I don't think we can entirely forget that that is one way in which elites tend to control the debate to make sure that it takes place on terms that suit them best. Essentially, if our message feels too tough, we won't be invited back. And this is a concern um, because I think it prevents us, and this always sounds a little bit pompous, but I'm going to say it anyway, it prevents us from speaking truth to power. So that's one area where I'd love to know more about what other people think, perhaps if we open this up in the Q&A. Pretty much finally, though, I think that addressing the failures of the diversity agenda as an equality agenda has almost never mattered more because it perpetuates an unequal status quo. And I don't think it's too controversial to say that the status quo is no longer working for the UK. 
So we are at a point when the majority of financial, professional and indeed political elites come from the most privileged backgrounds. And they often move with relative ease between those different fields. It seems to me that we've achieved almost the worst of both worlds, a non-meritocratic elite, which over quite a long time period now has operated largely in its own interests. And I don't know about other people, but this feels to me like it's taking our society and economy to the brink. Now, if I'm going to be optimistic, perhaps the coming crisis, I think there possibly is a coming crisis, could offer opportunities for real change. And I think the sorts of changes we need to make to our economy, our society, our organisations are large. If we're going to deliver a more equal society and a more sustainable form of capitalism that genuinely works for all of us. Now, to build that society, we are really going to need all our talents from all backgrounds who have energy and big ideas and creativity. And we also need to make sure to make that happen that status and money are much more equally shared to reduce inequalities of income and wealth, which in any case makes social mobility more difficult to affect. And that means that we almost certainly need to organise politically as well. But I do want to really underline that this is not an either or, um, it's more of a both and. So in other words, I think we can be mindful that elite organisations and indeed politicians don't use an apparent commitment to diversity or to social mobility to legitimate wider inequalities. And we can also be pleased and encouraged that many of these firms are making, or these elite firms are making active efforts to open up to more diverse candidates and to change their internal cultures and structures. So the kinds of things I'm thinking about here are widening the universities from which they recruit using contextual recruitment systems and CV blind techniques. Uh, firms are also working with organisations like the Social Mobility Foundation and Upreach, and I think we might have representatives from both here tonight, which is brilliant to so. The most progressive firms are looking at reducing barriers to career progression too, by taking a more critical look at their internal cultures and structures. So there is evidence that some change is happening and that some organisations are genuinely taking a more holistic approach to chapter talent because they know what a commitment to diversity and inclusion does bring. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. I am so happy to hand over to Sophie Pender next, um, behind of the 93% Club, to discuss it from her perspective and um, yeah, tell us what she thinks. So thank you so much and over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Louise. Um, I just want to apologise in advance for my voice because I'm slightly sick. Um, oh, my face has just come off and large on the screen. Um, so uh, I will try my best to make it as coherent as you, but I, I feel like it's quite a quite a big, uh, big shoes to fill. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I can see some familiar names on the attendees list. So it's really nice to be back in good company um, in what I'd like to think is quite a safe space to discuss these issues. And um, I remember meeting Louise for the first time um, at a conference earlier this year and hearing her speak and thinking, oh my God, am I, am I a case study? <laughs> am I a case study in, um, in this book? So when, um, when Louise invited me to speak, I was obviously absolutely chuffed um, to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me again, Louise. Um, and, and I agree that your, your work is incredible, um, but also fills me with a lot of conflict. And I think that um, the stuff that I'm gonna talk about now, um, whilst probably not as structured, um, I feel like there's no end point for me in terms of where I've landed. I'm not really sure I've made my mind up on this issue. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion later as well. But for those of you that don't know me, um, I am a lawyer at Herbert Smith Freehills, which is um, one of the world's leading international law firms. Um, I am, I think, objectively, um, as Louise described, in what might, some might describe elite in terms of economic earnings at least but we'll get on to the reasons why I don't really consider myself to truly be in the elite and maybe you know the reasons why I never will be um, but to start from the very beginning so you guys understand where I'm coming from I think it'd probably be helpful to tell you a little bit about myself and my family and, and I guess the social mobility story that got me here because I think one of the things that people don't really talk about when talking about social mobility particularly in an academic context um, are the real, the real stories behind it and actually the psychological aspects of social mobility and the trauma that comes with that and that's something that I'm really interested in and probably reflect on a bit too much uh, for my mental health anyway. Um, so I was born um, in 1996 in Edgware so I am 26 years old. Um, I grew up in Graham Park Council Estate 
so um i grew up with you know in a sort of two parent household um only child my mum was the youngest of 14 children um very large catholic family um who were very much encouraged to leave school and go to work and my mum described living in a, in a small bungalow where when she was a baby, she would sleep in the drawer. And when she had to have a bath, it'd be once a week and she'd have to share the water with her sister. So by every metric possible, she very much grew up on the breadline. Um, my dad was much, much the same. He was um, part of an Irish immigrant family, again, Catholic, not that there's any sort of relation to that, but a very strict family who didn't necessarily value education. Um, and my dad was thrown out at age 15 to live in squats. Um, and they met together, one, they, they, they met in a hospital, so doing clerical work or, you know, sort of, he was a porter and she did some, you know, admin. I wish I could sit here and say that um, my social mobility story is one of those stories where I talk about how my parents grew up really poor, but they worked really hard and, you know, they got amazing jobs and they sent me to an amazing private school. So therefore I'm working class. Um, which I hear a lot about these days. And that's, again, an interesting topic I think we should discuss about the sort of uh, the claiming of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. But that wasn't the case for me. Um, I, like a lot of people, got trapped in the cycle of poverty, which was that my, um, you know, my mum and dad, you know, that they may have, well, my mum certainly worked hard, my dad didn't, but, you know, I grew up very poor. Um, my dad was an alcoholic and he was a drug addict, um, which made life at home incredibly turbulent, which is another thing people don't really speak about when talking about sociability or the, the issues that come with that. Um, and so for most of my life, I grew up with an incredible amount of instability that had panic buttons in my flat. Um, you know, my mum didn't know when our next meal was coming from. And, and for much of my life, I spent a lot of time upwards managing my parents and, and being there for them when no one was really there for me. Um, and then when I was 12 years old, my dad passed away because of you know the reasons I described before. So by every metric I grew up, and I will use the term working class, um, I was on free school meals um, and I was part of the statistic that we all speak about, which are these, these individuals who are often left out of the conversation uh, when we talk about sociability. So, for me, it was really important that I focused on my education as a way of controlling my, my situation at home. Um, I got a lot of nurture in school. Um, I went to a school where 32% of us got a CIR above at GCSE. So really, you know, every layer on top of these things making it impossible for me to try and succeed. But for me, because I had so much instability in my home life, school was a really important outlet that I clung on to. And so um, I finished my A-levels becoming the first in my school to achieve three A-stars. Um, and I went to Bristol University, which was a huge achievement for me. Um, I didn't get into Oxford because uh, I <laughs> had an interview for English. And when they asked me uh, what books I'd read, I said Harry Potter and The Lovely Bones. And they, they swiftly told me, um, thank you, but no thanks, and told me to get out. So um, probably something in that as well, but that was my story to university. Um, and Louise mentioned earlier that I run an organization called the 93% Club and the 93% Club really did come out of my time at university, which was um, what some might describe as the steepest learning curve of my life. And when I got to university, um, it became very apparent to me that despite overcoming all of these obstacles that I had to to get there, um, I still wasn't good enough. Um, in the first week, people called me a chav. They mocked my accent. Um, they asked me constantly what school I'd gone to and I didn't understand the question at the time because I thought you know why does it matter I went to you know, my local state comp um, but what I realized at that time is that I was going through this weird sort of social sifting of trying to decide what camp I was in whether I was in you know the, the camp of people who were worth talking to um, or the people who had nothing to offer and this was a, a learning curve for me at the time and it got to my sort of second year of university where I realized that you know no matter how much I did to try and fit in, whether that be take out expensive laptops and phones on finance, or you know pretend to be interested in hobbies, or even sadly um, get to the point where I never invited any of my friends from university home to my council house um, because I was so ashamed of it. Nothing worked, um, and that was the point where you know I, I remember I was 19 years old. I was sat on my bed in my flat, and I created the 93% Club because I thought there must be more people out there feeling how I'm feeling. Um, and I must admit, you know, 
academia, being at university never really felt like a place where I belonged. And there are a number of factors to do with that, not necessarily just um, the people that I was surrounded with, but the way that I was taught as well, you know, being in a seminar was so alien to me because we were taught to, to you know, learn out of a textbook. No one had ever asked me before what my opinion was. And when I was at home, we never spoke about politics. We never spoke about, you know, what was going on in the world. We sat with a, you know, I never grew up with a dining table. I sat with a tray on my lap and, and watched TV. And that was the sort of scope of my discussion. So, you know, there were so many things that I was learning at such a late age. And rather than being encouraged to come along with the journey on them, I was, you know, I was sort of punished for, for not having that experience early on in life. So that was really difficult. And I think the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because when you meet me now, um, a lot of people assume that I am, well, you know, we can get into a discussion about whether or not I now consider myself middle class or, you know, from a higher socioeconomic background, you know, who, who knows really, this is the, the complicating factor, but a lot of people assume that I've come from a background with immense privilege. And whilst I do have a number of, you know, different privileges, um, it's a weird situation to be in where finally I feel accepted. Um, because I find myself now with this new accent and these, these new set of hobbies. And when I go home to my friends who are still, um, you know, in the council houses or still living at home and nothing has changed for them, I'm too posh for them. And then when I go into these sort of institutions where they have, you know, holidays to France and skiing trips and, and whatever, I'm, I'm still not posh enough for them. So you end up existing in this sort of, uh, this sort of mid phase. And, when I heard Louise speak about the city um, initially, I remember feeling so conflicted because on the one hand, this, this process that I had to go through to change myself so that I was acceptable and so people wouldn't bully me anymore um, was so traumatic for me that I felt so disassociated with who I am. And, you know, to an extent, I still feel that way. And there are days where I don't know where the old me stops and the new me begins and you know what elements of myself I've actually managed to retain because you have to undergo so much transformation to fit into these spaces so I remember you know listening to these and thinking yeah you know it's people don't talk about the fact that you know there is this idea of diversity but it's actually diversity so long as you can fit into the mold so long as that you are pal so long as you are palatable in that diversity um, and I'd never thought about that before then I thought to myself, you know, should I, would I, if I could go back now, would I do things differently? Would I have retained my accent? Would I have, you know, would I have changed anything? And, you know, I grappled with this for a, for a long time. And actually, weirdly, the conclusion that I came to was, no, I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, and this is a, a conversation I'm interested in hearing people's thoughts on. But as, mu as much as I agree that, that the city has changed me to an extent that, you know, sometimes I struggle with on a daily basis, the idea of going back to a situation where, you know, my mum used to have to rummage through green bins outside of um, shops to sell things in car boots and had to, you know, walk to get a bag of potatoes so she, so she can feed us is far worse than having to undergo that psychological trauma to get to where you need to be. Um, and I think that's a really sad thing that when you're from a working class background, that's the decision you have to make, you know, it's either sort of stay in your box and, and suffer financially or become a completely new person. So um, I think that's all I really wanted to say, but th these are the thoughts that was, you know, I have absolutely no notes. So that was just me rambling to be honest, but um, I think the psychology of social mobility is an incredibly important concept that people haven't explored enough. Um, and it's definitely something that I would be interested in talking to you guys about this evening. So um, I look forward to hearing from the other panelists, thank you so much for inviting me to speak, Louise, and I look forward to an, an incredible evening. Thank you so much, Sophie, for sharing your experiences. Um, that was really so powerful to hear. And your insights, um, which really uh, were, um, I, I think, were striking. And I, I'm sure people will have a lot to say about and they link so much to Louise's um, academic work. So thank you for that. Shall I hand over to Nabila to, um, to talk? Yeah, I'm happy to take over. So um, I just wanna speak about some of my experiences and um, you know what organizations can do for when they think about diversity. So just to start, I, I come from a working class background um, 
you know, it's all I really knew growing up. My parents didn't have city jobs, so I basically knew nothing until I started working. Um, and that's when I, so when I started working, that's when I saw all the changes and all the differences. And one of the biggest challenges that I experienced was just the culture shock. And it was something that I had to adapt to and learn how to navigate through. So I thought it would be nice for me to just spend this evening just talking about the different culture and what organisations can do to make it easier for people who come from a similar background to myself when they are thinking about hiring um, employees for diversity. So just to begin with, one of the biggest challenges that I experienced was the culture of drinking. You know, a lot of socials, networking events, even lunches with clients involved alcohol and it was very new. So I grew up in a Muslim household where alcohol was obviously not permitted. So to go from an environment, to go from a strict environment like that to now my work includes alcohol was very uncomfortable at first, but I learned how to adapt to it and kind of go around it. But I think what's key here is that organisations need to understand that not everyone's comfortable in certain situations and to be mindful that if someone doesn't attend this, it shouldn't put them at a disadvantage. And my team are quite good at combating this where now recently we started every Friday in the evenings we'll play games for like half an hour, whether it's quizzes or short games or fun games, just an, a lighthearted way to build that relationship with your colleagues. Um, same way you would have built it in, in, a, in a social event, but just without alcohol and a lot more friendly environment. But I know for, for some companies, um, you know, there's no change and it's still the same. And I'm not saying get rid of socials that have alcohol or um, drinking, but just to have more inclusive events. Because even though, although I'm Muslim, I know my Christian colleague, she also didn't want to attend and it can be taken in a negative light. So that's just one way that was a, a bit of a shock. Um, another culture shock for me was the way of working. So although I knew, you know, nine to five is when you're typically expected to work and it might be that you have to stay logged on, which is totally fine. But when it becomes the norm, you know, to consistently stay on logged on till late and, you know, that's the best way to be seen as hardworking, to get the promotion, you know, to be seen like, okay, you're really doing a lot for the company. It can be hard for someone who can't commit the same. So typically when organisations hire grads or student leavers, you know, they're young, you typically expect them to settle down and have a family five to 10 years in, into their careers when they are at a much senior grade. So they'll have the authority to work more flexible. So when a new joiner decides, you know, um, I want to go on mat leave or, you know, I'm married or I have a family, it is a bit of a shock and companies, I don't know if they can, I don't know if they know how to accommodate to that. Um, luckily, I was, um, I was with a company where people have gone in maternity very early in their career, so they know how to accommodate to that. But I know for some, it's not the same. And if you're not able to stay logged in till late, you know, you're not as hardworking. So I think organisations do need to be mindful to look at an individual based on their personal circumstances and understand that, okay, if we're gonna invite people from different backgrounds, that not everyone will be on the same stage in their lives and not everyone will have the same goals. And we're not all like robots, you know, start their careers, back to 10 years, have a family, and that's when we settle down. Some people might wanna do that early on, you know, like myself, I was married when I started my career. So family life was important to me and I wanna know that my employers would support that. So yeah, that's just um, one way that I think can be challenging for some. Um, and another shock was, it's not a shock, but I think for me, it's something that's important. And I think organisations should think about it. It's just the facilities that they provide in their workspaces. Um, and what I mean by this is, so I'm a Muslim and I pray five times a day, but I've worked for previous companies, so I just couldn't meet the obligation. You know, it's not something that employees really think about when they invite uh, employees to work for them. They just provide a desk and a computer and, you know, they say, that's it, that's enough. You sit there eight hours a day and you just work for us. But I think it's important they do go above and beyond, especially if they are thinking about diversity, is how can we really cater to their needs and how can we meet their needs? Because because as because of that experience where, you know, I couldn't pray as part of my due diligence when I look for a job or when I'm interviewing, I do ask what facilities do you have? And I research what do they do in terms of diversity? Like, what are they physically doing um, to encourage diversity, not just having a, a number on their, on their books. Um, and it's not just facilities. I think if you're going to invite people to practice, you, do, you need to think about things like dietary requirements, you know, vegan food, halal food, things like that, I think really do impact your morale and how you fit in in the workplace. If you're going to be spending at least eight hours a day, you want to feel comfortable, you want to feel happy. 
um, and you want to feel like you are thought of. So they were just, you know, some of my thoughts and um, experiences um, in this industry. And I thought it'd be quite nice to share and what organisations can do. Um, so I'll just pass over to you, um, Ariana. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so my name is Ariana and thanks, Nabila. Um, yeah, I, so I'm currently working in the finance industry and I've, I mean, I've only been working for them for about a year and a bit now because before that I was studying in China for my master's. So I think even first and foremost, listening to all this, I think it's so lovely that we are even able to have this conversation. We're almost privileged because I think you can't have it in certain nations, let's put it that way. So I think it's amazing that we can even talk about this in general all together and uh, reflect on how organizations are should be held accountable for for diversity in their organizations um i do believe very strongly in the fact that i don't think it's all doom and gloom although it might sound quite intimidating but I do think Louise's research is actually quite important to just almost put things into perspective. It doesn't mean it's not possible because, I mean, we're all sitting here coming from low earning backgrounds or working class backgrounds. I myself was born abroad, so English is even my first language, which I always find hilarious that people don't want to believe me today. But until I moved here when I was eight, I didn't speak any English at all. But I did realise very quickly, oh, with my German accent or a little twang that people would maybe treat me a bit differently so then I worked very hard and read extra like books and would try my pronunciation and everything and now I'm at an okay native standard I think so um I do think it is in um it's not it's not necessarily important because I know people that have kept on to their accents and because also they speak so much of their native language at home but I do think diversity as a like looking at your own personal path you should be thinking okay what is it that I want for myself and then there are unspoken things that you might have to do or amend which I mean I think also as Nabila noted like even just going to events and having people drinking alcohol all the time is a lot I think to to really accustomed to but some organizations like my my like my organization they we do have like events all together online where we like get to meet which is quite nice and we do have kind of diversity type uh, activities that are done to ensure that everyone gets together because we have a, a quite a diverse background because there's a lot of languages in our team um that isn't a very easy way i think where some some uh, organizations will have diversity is purely because of the language requirements so um, if they have, if they're, very, if they're a very international company, like obviously HSBC is very international, they will be automatically having people from many different backgrounds, many different languages that will then all be working together. And I think that can be quite interesting. And even though it might be a bit of a, it might be a bit of a change for the people that uh, when they first hired us, for example, um, I think it is, it is something that, um, they are trying and I think it is good that we are able to talk about it amongst amongst ourselves. Um, I would like to note though one more thing is that um, I would say that if you are looking to go into banking, law or any, any of those so-called elite um, industries, I think it is definitely doable from any background. By all means, please don't be this discouraged or anything because I don't think that is the the goal of what Louise's research even shows it just kind of shows you okay there may be some things that they might say it's it's all it's all equal but actually there are some hidden kind of not rules but things that they do abide by whereas people you will see those people that oh my mum worked for this company and her friend happen to give me an internship so then they already have the work experience to then get into those graduate roles which are the ones that of course we might be groveling very hard to even just try and just fit in um but yeah that's about that's about it thank you so much for those again really interesting insights and i'm sure there'll be lots of questions and lots of um comments and thoughts 
Um, I'm going to hand over to Lizzie, who's going to chair the Q&A from now. OK, so um, please, uh, any questions that anyone's got, please put them in the Q&A section and I will um, pass them on. And um, I'm sure panel members may also have some questions for one another. So the first one is a practical question, which is whether the recording of the lecture is going to be made public. So, Louise, do you want to address that just so people know? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, we, we hope to make it public. Um, we will just confer amongst panellists after the event just to make sure that everyone's happy to do so. And if we have everybody's permission, it, it will be made public. So the recording should be available once everyone's agreed to that. Is okay. it, can, I just, can I just, while we're waiting for other questions, and I suppose we should remind people to put questions in the in the box, can I just add one um, one point or just a couple of points as a response? To, of course, absolutely. So if there were, I was thinking if there were things you wanted to say in response to Yeah, what... just, just maybe while people are kind of thinking of questions to ask us, and I hope there's loads. Um, oh, well, I just wanted to say thank you to Sophie and Ariana and Nabila for those amazing reflections. One thing I didn't say or didn't really talk about so much in my introduction was kind of the second half of my book where I do focus much more heavily on those social mobility journeys. I don't like the terminology necessarily that we use around this, but um, I do write about that in more detail. And one of the things that um, I do try to get to is that there are so many tensions and contradictions in this debate in terms of kind of recognizing the barriers and, and acknowledging that they exist, but also not trying to suggest that these, these kind of journeys, these access to these firms is impossible or necessarily awful because it's not. But one thing that I do try to underline and, and uh, something I write about is what I call institutionalized dishonesty. And I think there is what I call institutionalized dishonesty in the city, in the sense that um, often organizations will construct and sell a narrative of merit. So they will tell young people in particular that these organizations are meritocratic, that your background, that your gender, that your ethnicity will make no difference at all. And people kind of often move perhaps into the graduate recruitment process and into these organizations with that belief. And then often they find out it's not quite true. And discovering that can be incredibly isolating. It can lead to real disillusion. It can lead to real dismay. And in my experience, in my research at least, there's not always many places that people can discuss this. It's not easy always to discuss it with colleagues because there is this sort of meritocratic myth that circulates. And sometimes we talk about diversity, we're a very famous um, academic called Sarah Ahmed, talked about uh, diversity as happy talk. We kind of talk optimistically all the time and organizations find things that they want found. And sometimes we don't really get to the, the truth, if you like. So I suppose I think that's just a really important thing that we tackle collectively, that we're honest and realistic, but also supportive. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the first thing is actually in a way a comment, but I will uh, from uh, from a uh, about, it's a suggestion to Sophie about um, some work being done in the US by Jennifer Morton. I'm not sure if uh, maybe Louise is aware of her too, an American academic who's written a lot about the personal costs of upward social mobility, mainly in the education context. And I guess, um, uh, so that's a point, and maybe Sophie already knows about it, but interesting that this is arising in different um, areas, this idea of the costs potentially of, uh, of social mobility. Okay, and then not two questions, which are one uh, directed to Louise, and but any other panelists, please do jump in if you'd like to. How do we help the social or diversity revolution along from inside our organizations, in particular financial ones? And secondly, related to that, what is the motivation for organizations to do this if doing it questions the entrenched elite positions that also serve them? So any answers to that? Yeah, I, I can come in, but I also would like other panelists to answer both those questions because I think they're probably better placed in some ways to do so. Um, 
Oh, I think kind of Navila particularly has talked about some of the things that organizations can do internally. But one thing I, I think also going back to Sophie's point that I would really underline is that I think to some extent we do need to situate this within its wider context. So um, again, one of the things that I tried to get across in the book is that organizations are not isolated from that wider context, they're part of it. So elite organizations sort of contribute to the inequalities that make social mobility in particular more difficult to happen. But generally, we live in a society with very steep inequalities of income and wealth. And when we have those very steep inequalities, growing up poor can be extremely stigmatizing. And in some senses, the wider those inequalities grow, the more stigmatizing it can be. And people don't necessarily leave that stigma at the doors of organizations or these elite organizations, they bring it with them. And what I find in my research is that it can be amplified there as well. And so although organizations cannot solve that necessarily, um, I think they can acknowledge it at least. And I think collectively we need to acknowledge it. And so while I also don't think that reducing those inequalities of income and wealth is a panacea, it won't solve every problem, I think it would reduce some at least. So again, I feel like we need to be really aware of those relationships between society at large and what happens within organizations. Um, and then, you know, I think there's a various, a, a few things that organizations can do internally. I mean, I'd almost like to kind of throw this back to Sophie and Ariana and Nabila. Have they got any thoughts particularly and they'd like to come in here? I don't know, yeah, Sophie. Yeah, ha happy to, I mean, this is, a, this is something that I've been grappling with in my, own organization and um, in the work that we do with the 93% club, it's gone through various iterations of our sort of theory of change. And that's the word that people use when we talk about like organizations, like what is your theory of change? Sorry, that was a side note. Um, but I um, I kind of always thought that sort of getting in the, I guess to an extent you sort of have to encourage, organizations have to hire more diversely in order to change themselves because if you don't have a senior leadership team that cares about the issue frankly you're not going to get anywhere um what i have found to be i guess somewhat effective just from a practical point of view is um if you are trying to make change yourself uh, maybe you're slightly more junior is finding someone who is more senior to care about the issue and, and sort of bring them along that journey with you um the other thing is i guess thinking cynically is identifying areas in the supply chain where someone will care about it so for law firms that is clients and if you find that clients care about the issue law firms will care about the issues and i imagine it's similar to banks as well um i think louise makes a really interesting point which is that if, for me i feel like there is a systemic change that is needed more widely in order for there to be any any real meaningful change. Um, but I think practically speaking, if, if you are trying to sort of make change within your own organization, you need to identify those pressure points where people can't ignore you. Um, I don't know if um, Ariane or Nabila wants to come in on that. Um, the only thing I can think of is um, actually a real life example. Um, I used to work for Deutsche Bank whilst I was actually studying at Queen Mary. So I was doing part-time as for their fraud credit card department it was yeah one of those jobs um but but i really enjoyed it and they were um very skeptical on hiring me because i was so young um apologies if you can hear sirens outside but anyway, because i was so young they were very um skeptical of hiring me because i think i was only just only just 17 or something when i had applied and they were in desperate need of german speakers so that is the only reason i think i even got the job in the first place but um, they were so impressed with me for, for my professionality, for whatever, how professional I was on the phone from my young age, that they actually started hiring a lot more younger people. And they realized, oh, if we hire some German speaking students, they might, they're a lot more flexible. So suddenly they had three or four uh, German speaking students. This is about a year after I started. But I think a lot of that can be that they, number one, if they do hire diversity, it's almost, it's almost like they're, they're trying and if they do hire someone that is maybe of a different background or something, then for them to have the positive comments, so that's why I think everyone can be 
almost helping each other is for example if I have a colleague that is I have a wonderful colleague for example in India that I work with sometimes and if I'm speaking to my manager and I'm like oh this person is doing fantastic work they are always replying super fast super helpful I'm really happy to work they're like oh I didn't know that then suddenly that recognition's being trickled along and then I feel like that can also almost like um like the mindset has to change of oh it's not suddenly there it's the new people and it's a scary different a different picture of what they're envisioning of maybe a leader or a manager to be suddenly it's like oh we start to trust these people and then slowly or um but surely that can change and in our organization we have something called um the like best best of points so you can kind of give recognition points to people that have helped you can do it anonymously or you cannot and that gives quite a nice um that is quite a nice way where people can really get some recognition even from you, you can be a graduate you can be of course managers will get it as well but um anyone can get these points from their managers from other people and that is, it kind of helps get the word out that oh okay you don't have to be the big boss to be helpful and I think that gives a quite a nice showcase on individuals that are actually working hard um yeah I think that that's been quite helpful and I think in well for my organization anyway um we do can now have um a head of our department who's newly been appointed who is not your your average Joe <laughs> that you'd expect so I think I remember when he was introduced I, I was quite surprised like pleasantly surprised that they took that as a which is almost sad that I'm surprised but um but yeah I think they are trying but I think as as peers we can all help by acknowledging that also giving a compliment on someone else's work who might be completely opposite I, what you expect help I've now got a mass of questions <laughs> in so if I we might need to um to get through a few of them given that we've only got half an hour we might need to um both bunch of you but also um uh yeah just do our best to get through them so there's two that have come in that in a way I'm, I'm gonna try to relate someone so there was the one that I already said about motivation so what will the motivation be given to make a difference given that in a way what you've said and what your research has um shown is uh this sense that um the way it works at the moment serves uh these organizations well so there's a disincentive to change and the uh, and another person that i see a relation here is saying you talked about a reworked version of ca capitalism but is it ever possible to um have a fair version of capitalism so i guess it boils down to how realistic or possible is that so if louise if you want to answer those and then uh, there's a whole bunch of others which are about kind of specific uh initiatives so maybe if you answer that louise then i'll come back with the yeah. others about specific yeah. initiatives absolutely yeah sure so the motivation is such an interesting one and i i don't even know if i always have all the answers on this one but one of the things i say about the business case which is often used as the primary motivation at the moment for change is it's not that i don't think the business case exists and i think there is a business case for employing and promoting diverse talent i think that's really important and i think organizations do get that um but what i tried to get across is that the business case can only change quite incremental or only drive quite incremental change because there are these sort of competing arguments in favor of the status quo so once again we sort of don't see that um that paradox if you like that balance in, t in terms of pressures towards change but not changing too far and so often that involves organizations making quite a lot of compromise and some of the, the, the people who literally have to compromise are people who are coming from non-traditional backgrounds who are sort of having to and i think we've heard a bit about that tonight have to embody that kind of balance between reputation and status so they can be different as long as they're the same and there are these incredibly strong pressures towards um assimilation but the other thing on motivation is that um i mentioned when i started that quite often unfair practices are locked in within organizations because of interactions with other organizations in the same field and that can make them incredibly difficult to change 
So one of the things I think in terms of motivation is being much more open about that, um, being much more open in the city and elsewhere about how inequalities have served organisations, how they've had this purpose, and therefore what we genuinely need to do to unravel them. And what, what, will, what happens there is that it's very unlikely that one firm will act alone to make more what I would call radical or dramatic changes. They do need to act together because if there's a risk, there's safety in numbers, if you like. Um, and in a sense, that can mean that at least some of these changes um, can or, or probably need to be mandated in some sense in order to make them happen um, because they just won't happen through a voluntary diversity and inclusion kind of business case. It needs to be something a little bit more muscular than that, if you like, which is why I sometimes talk about quotas, for example, as being necessary in certain areas. So um, that, that's one thing about motivation, I think, more broadly, and this comes under the capitalist um, point, I suppose. I think maybe we need to get away from a focus on out and out profit maximization. I think that's probably um, not conducive to equality. Very intensive competition doesn't really drive um, equality. Often we think that it does because it's associated with economic efficiency, but it doesn't always work that way. So we need to sort of almost reduce that to some extent. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if a rework capitalism is possible. I, I kind of, and I don't know precisely what it would look like, but I, I do at the very back of my book give some kind of suggestions on what it could look like drawing on other people who are much more expert than me in terms of kind of how economies and societies would work. And that would be kind of things like reforming our financial system, um, having a sort of green, um, a green focus so we can kind of build the economy by focusing on green projects and introducing wealth taxes, for example, to properly redistrib redistribute um, income or wealth. I, I think those things would be possible, but I think we have to think big. And I sometimes wonder that whether, I mean, I think the last time we thought that big as a nation was after World War II, when there was a genuine appetite for something completely different from what had come before. And this sounds a little bit nihilistic, perhaps, but I do wonder whether what looks like is going to be possibly a major crisis coming up could be the catalyst to push us towards something genuinely different. And I must be honest, this is getting a little bit away from the, the subject of the book, but I worry that if as an electorate we're not offered something completely different, then something quite dangerous, politically dangerous, will come in and fill that vacuum. And that is something that is quite terrifying to me at the moment. So I think it's never been more necessary. Whether I think it will happen, I'm not absolutely sure. So I'll stop there, bit of a ramble, sorry. Thank you. Okay, the next one that I just wanna give Sophie a chance to address. Um, so I'm gonna try and group two things. One is that someone said that they'd never heard of the 93% club and keen to hear about how they can get involved and join. And I suspect that's something quite a lot of audience members would like to know about. But also other people, someone's raised specifically asking you, Sophie, about promotion and your experience of that, but so as not to put you on the spot, I guess I might reframe that a bit and just say, is that um, a, another person has talked about uh, whether, whether panelists have things to say about what they've called the concrete ceiling? Um, experienced by diverse individuals within hierarchies um, and so I guess is this something that uh, I'm, I'm rewording the question partly um, uh, to keep track of it but is this something that you'd want to talk about about the um, there being more diversity lowered down so to speak in the organization and issues about promotion and kind of getting on. So that would be something for really everyone to approach. But Sophie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, in relation to the 93% club, I think I will just um, give Louise some materials to circulate afterwards because, uh, you know, I could sit here and personally plug it all night, but I think that's probably not very interesting to everyone. But in terms of what we actually do, um, it, you know, I founded it when I was uh, 19, it was a Facebook page and it had sort of, it's, you know, I kind of call it like a startup charity, it has loads of different iterations where I've basically sat down and tried to figure out how to solve this issue <laughs> and then I had to rework it because I'm one person and, and can't do everything, but 
Um, I think the direction of travel we're currently in is that we are aiming to effectively increase the social capital of state educated students. Um, because what we find when you go into the city or when you go into a professional services um, job is that uh, as much as you may have got the grades and got through the grad scheme, your circle of influence is still much smaller than um, those of your peers who went to a private school. So we're effectively using the old boys network against itself and providing opportunities to state educated students in the same way that the old boys would provide it to one another. So that is the idea of the 93% club. And it, re it relates to um, promotions and concrete ceilings uh, quite nicely. I won't comment specifically on my own uh, on my own experience. However, what I will say is that um, I, I'm in a weird position in that I, I subjectively go through um, these processes as being someone who is a working class individual um, or was a working class individual, again, it's really complicated um, in this environment um, and, and fundamentally doesn't really know how to navigate it. And also at the same time, objectively looking at this environment and sort of having this like third party experience where I kind of know from an academic point of view that I don't know how, how to navigate it. So it's a, it's a bit of a weird one that even when you're hyper aware of the fact that there is a there is an unspoken network that helps you to get along, you still fundamentally don't know the social cues to navigate that, if that makes sense. So I think my experience of... Um, of being in the legal industry is being hyper aware of the fact that I, I don't necessarily know how, how to get on. Um, and there was an interesting report about getting on and getting in. Um, and I think the thing that I'm currently grappling with personally is, is the getting on part, which may be unusual to a lot of people because I think on the surface, I come across as someone who has probably got their shit together. <laughs> I don't think I said it on recording. Uh, it's not the BBC, it's fine. But, uh, you know, someone who ha has got their stuff together and, um, you know, has navigated things pretty well. Mm -hmm. But um, I am continually, um, every day, learning that there is another aspect of myself that I need to adapt and change to be able to get on in this environment. And um, I saw another question come through about, and I'll just, I guess I'll tie this in about my accent and whether or not people if I would have succeeded despite my accent and um, the honest answer is I'm not sure. Um, what I will say is that I have noticed a stark difference in the way that people treated me um, when I spoke, I can't even remember how I used to speak, but people would sort of call me Chavi and Essexy um, compared to how I speak now. Um, and it's a, it's a really weird experience because, you know, when I set up the 93% club, um, and I had this accent and I had all, all the mannerisms of an actual sort of working class individual. Um, it wasn't palatable to people. So people shot it down and I'd get messages at three in the morning saying, you're a, I think someone called me once a sort of a, a left wing Corbyn licking quiche munching left. It was something, something like that. It was three in the morning. It was, it was very confusing. And now when I talk about it from my position as being a, an M&A lawyer at a top institution, um about this this club people really accept it and listen to it and then the topic of social mobility suddenly is of interest to them so it's a really another interesting dynamic about who is shouting about this issue and actually what i have found is that if you are shouting about the issue um whilst you are firsthand experiencing it you have far less influence than someone who is shouting about the issue who is maybe looking at it retrospectively or who is who's got more of like a you know i guess a personal interest in it even if it's not sort of firsthand so that's another interesting dynamic um, that I've experienced. So I think to answer your question, um, I still don't necessarily understand the system that I'm currently operating in. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. Part of the issue is looking for role models. So at the moment, I you know I look up at the legal industry, not just necessarily my law firm, and I don't I can't see anyone who has had the same experience as me. And that's not to say they're not out there, but I suspect that that person either doesn't talk about it or has completely assimilated and like me, struggles to recognize who they used to be. So I think one of the really important things about, you know, unpicking this structure that we're currently in, if we're not gonna have a radical overthrow of the system, which unfortunately I don't think there's an app appetite for at the moment, I think we can all do our bit to, to look at the system, think about who it works for, um, how it works for them, and actually, you know, be smart about it and apply that system to people who it doesn't work for. You know, if you have a job opportunity, make an introduction to someone who is not your friend, who is not your family. Think about reaching out to someone who wouldn't otherwise have that opportunity. Um, 
was a very existential answer to a few questions. <laughs> but I, I'm happy to pick up separately with people in a sort of Chatham House Rules style conversation. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I see that um, Alicia, who's helping us today, and thank you, has put a link in the web to the 93% Club. I, I know that um, Nabila or Ariana, would you want to say anything about the kind of promotion and sort of role model and concrete ceiling type issue and whether you see problems there and solutions? Um, yeah, I'm happy to chime in on this one. Um, regarding the concrete ceiling, I do think diversity is on the agenda for a lot of companies, but I think it's a very slow, uh, it's a very slow process. So it's, I don't think we're going to straight away see a lot of you know, senior managers and directors and partners who are from diverse backgrounds. I think it is, I think it's going to be a, a bit of a slow process. I mean, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough where in my team, I do have um, senior managers or directors that do come from diverse backgrounds. And previously I mentioned um, how my team would do um, like little fun games in the afternoon that actually started by reaching out to those specific managers because we found that um, we found a common ground, you know, we do care about diversity, but um, in terms of promotion um, and progressing, I think, um, I won't talk about my personal experiences as much, but I don't see it as um, stopping people in my team um, because we do have a certain structure and um, a way to progress and to, you know, achieve those promotions that you can, you do get a lot of guidance in that sense, but I know for other teams, it's not the same. So um, uh, it's sort of like our team says, you'd, pro you'd know if you won't get promoted, that you have to be really, really bad to not get promoted. Um, so if you're, if you're doing your work, it's okay, but I know for other teams, it's not the same. I think, which is why I do see managers from diverse backgrounds in my team, um, but it's not a lot. Like, I think there's like out of 10, I think probably two or three that do come from diverse backgrounds. But like I said before, I think it's a very slow process till we see a fully diverse management team um, and till we see big change. I definitely see it going that way, um, but I think we are part of that change and it's um, part of our responsibility you know, to go for those promotions and be brave and you know ask for it and don't feel as though that you can't get those roles because another issue that I have seen is people tend to um, jump ship and go to another company because they feel as though they won't get that promotion. But if you, if you keep jumping ship, you will never get that grade. So just go for it, take that risk and do your best to get those roles so that you can also be a role model to, role model to the new joiners who are who come from similar backgrounds. So. That is very positive and inspiring. <laughs> Ariana, I know that you said that you've only been at your place for a year and a half. Is it, don't feel you need to chime on this. We've got millions of questions, but would you? OK, so I've, I've made notes and I apologise for the question as if I'm paraphrasing too much, but there were several which were about kind of asking about particular um, particular sort of areas where something might be done and if you have views on you know what what can be done and you know whether they work and if they can be made to work better so one is someone asking about have you got any examples of good meritocratic recruitment practices so particular practices that might work another person asking about um, if an organization genuinely wants to make a difference and is struggling um, how, would you have any suggestions around for example how they frame KPIs key performance indicators would you see any benefit or value in that um, and then another question about networks, whether panelists think those helpful, they work or got issues about them, um, and specifically whether you, you see any around class. Okay, so I hope you've made notes of that, but if, shall I start with you, Louise, and then we'll move through? Yeah, thanks, thanks Lizzie. I'll try and answer those quite quickly and move with the other panelists um in terms of what works i think that was the first question and kind of meritocratic recruitment practices i think in terms of sort of um particularly opening up in the relation to social class the most has been done in the area of opening access as opposed to looking at career progression and cultures within organizations and so there is um 
there is evidence around what works in terms of kind of using things like contextual recruitment and recruiting from a wider range of universities. Um, and I mentioned also in my talk kind of CV blind techniques. And I think those are are having a difference in terms of opening access, which I think is really positive. I don't know if um, Lindsay McMillan's here tonight, but she's also running, she's at UCL and she's running a, um, a project uh, for the Nuffield Foundation, which is going to look much more closely at what works in terms of opening access to particularly elite occupations using um, kind of st uh, statistical data, looking at kind of access and, and appointment rates and that kind of thing. So I think that we also will get more information over time about particularly what is working at that point. But we do also know there is plenty of evidence that, um, and for example, by the Bridge Group, who I also do some work with, have looked at what happens in early career. And for example, one study that they've done has found that um, when people from uh, working class backgrounds come into elite law firms, they have no difference in performance. Well, in fact, they might outperform their peers, but they're less likely to be kept on and they're more likely to leave. So we know that access is not I mean, it's important, but it's not everything. And we have to really focus about on what happens past that point. And I think that on the whole, it's fair to say that we have less evidence overall about what's really effective there. Although we have things like kind of employee resource groups and networks and role modeling, and there is, there is some good practice. Um, going on in that area. Um, KPIs is a really interesting one because I think, I suppose we have to think about difference and whether people, demographics are changing and that's a really important KPI. One of the really interesting things about the diversity agenda, which again, I write about in my book, is often it's very, best practice and diversity can be very divorced from evidence of improved outcomes. So often we see practices labeled best practice and diversity that have no discernible um, impact on improved outcomes for underrepresented groups. And basically we have to be really careful of that because then diversity does really fill that legitimating kind of um, function even more so. So I think, you know, and the whole KPIs probably need to be split between kind of evidence of improved outcomes for otherwise underrepresented groups, but also more qualitative measures in terms of kind of how people feel included, but we do have to remember that a sense of inclusion doesn't necessarily equate to equal outcomes. That's really important. And then what's the last one on social networks and whether there are networks, sorry Lucy, for people from um, less privileged backgrounds, whatever. It was a general one about networks, kind of good, bad, and do they cover class in your experience? In terms of, if, if it's in terms of networks that are set up, I think networks within organisations, I think that's how I interpreted it. I'll double check. So, well, in, OK, well, in both ways, I mean, networks are incredibly important in so many different jobs in terms of who you know is really important. And one of the things we also know from the figures is that um, people from underrepresented backgrounds, less privileged backgrounds tend to progress through organisations more slowly. Um, than people from more privileged backgrounds on the whole, that def definitely does happen. But we also know that in professional careers, up until sort of senior manager level, uh, what you know is really important, your technical skills. But once you get to kind of senior manager level, perhaps into the partnership, what becomes very important is who you know. And it's at that point often that we see and I'm just going to use a generic white middle class man, sorry about that, but um, is when they start leapfrogging people who are perhaps almost level pegging with them up to that point, because at that point they are able to leverage the networks necessary to gain promotion in a way that other groups are not so easily. So we see that changing throughout people's careers. I hope that kind of answered those questions. I'll, I'll pass over to the rest of the panel. Fantastic. Is there anything any of you would want to say about any of those? I guess the question about, I think the question was about organisational networks, so affinity networks within your organisations, like about women or um, uh, or uh, minorities, and, and specifically, are you seeing those emerging about class? Anyone want to say anything about that or not? I think, um, I think there are networks emerging that there is a, I think in, in my experience of networks and organizations, not necessarily just my own, but there's a real lack of understanding in terms of the, the language behind social mobility and socioeconomic background and class. 
such that I think that when people gather in the network, they're not, they almost don't really have the language or the sort of the understanding of what they're trying to tackle. And what I find really interesting is that I find myself in spaces, I guess, like such as this, where we have very um, sort of intense uh, academic conversations about it, such that we can identify the issues we're trying to solve. But actually, I think that there is some somewhat of a skills gap in the networks themselves and organisations to actually identify the issues that they're trying to fix, because it's it's not as um, it's not as clear cut as something like sexism, for example, where we all, you know, as women, it's like, you know, stop wolf whistling at me or calling me babe in the office or something like that. You know, it's a lot more insidious and subtle, which is that you know, you may not realise that you actually don't have a mentor who can mentor you throughout your career. You don't really realise that um, you're being judged on different metrics. And I think that's the issue is that because, you know, social mobility, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it is a, a real emerging topic in DNI. I think the people who are experiencing it firsthand don't really know how to put their finger on it. You know, you, you can sense that something is going on and something's happening to you, but you're not quite sure what it is. Um, because it's not overt as something like sexism or, or, or racism or, uh, you know, homophobia, you know, which also does have its subtleties. But I al almost think that the issue around class and because no one likes talking about class is so much more insidious. So I, I think networks are a really positive thing um, and it's great to bring people together who have the same uh, experiences. However, if you don't have if you don't know what you're looking out for, then I'm not sure you can solve it. So I think if there is, if there are any organisations on here who do have networks, I would encourage you to, um, and this is not just about you know, class or your social equity background or whatever you want to call it, any, any network, you need to empower those people to know exactly what they're trying to solve. And also, you know, I'll also remunerate them for doing so. I, I find that, you know, this is another separate point, but you know, people who who suffer the most are the ones who have to pick up the slack a lot of the time in trying to advocate for themselves. And it's it's seldom reflected in the way that they're sort of treated at the organization. And it's a, an additional level of um, you know, brain power that you have to exercise on top of your job. So, you know, if there are people who are picking up the slack, then you know, make sure that that's reflected in, in pay scales and, and their progression. Link laters which is a, another elite law firm, have done something really interesting that I've been pushing for for a while at my own firm, but um, big organisations are sl slow to move because of all the layers of, you know, politics and, and whatnot, but they've just introduced billable hours for individuals who do DNI to encourage um, individuals to actually go out and do something about it. And so what they've done is that they have tied people's pay to whether or not they actually contribute to DNI. And I think that will be really, really powerful. And it's something that I would like to see more of. Um, I've spoken to people about it before. They said it's too political, but I think, you know, if you're an organization that is using DNI as a greenwashing exercise to try and market yourself, um, you should really talk. Talk, you know, walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and actually pay the members of staff in your organization that carry the workload for you. Good, interesting. Um, I've got uh, some others which I might ask, and then if Nabila and Ariana particularly want to come on in on them, that would be helpful. So it's not me asking, I'm trying to channel the questioners. So we've got a few questions about education. Um, so are there things that ought to be being done in universities to assist, really? Um, in this project of creating fairer and more inclusive workplaces, uh, particularly in the city. And someone asked specifically of Ariana and Nabila whether QM helped you. I'm sure we can we welcome the feedback, even if it's negative, because we want to do as what we can. Um, but linked to that is uh, another person has asked, particularly you, Louise, um, is what should sort of so-called, what should academics be doing, even that you might call activists um, who want to engage and challenge. And um, so how to, have you got tips about how effectively to do that? Because it's a complicated space to inhabit where you're both, you're challenging, um, but you, you, you sincerely want to help organizations to change and do better. Any tips about that? Okay. So Ariana, do you want to say anything about the education side of things? Um, I think for Queen Mary, the 
when I was studying that, I remember very distinctly there was one talk which was like a female in business talk something it was it was in one of the I think it was like in like the outside the drama area and they just had a few women that obviously already were alumni and they spoke and they were just saying about their experiences as just women going into business and I remember going to that thinking like oh like this one lady I think she was working for Disney I was like oh that's cool like I can really do something if I want to if that makes sense because I think a big thing is that for women we often like said oh um you know if you want to be maybe senior management you have to sacrifice having maybe a personal life having children having all this you can't have it all which is I think even something that my mother would say to me when I was younger you know you can't have it all because that's the generation that they, they grew up in but actually that's not necessarily the case anymore it's just a, a point of well, what thinking about what is it that you actually want and what maybe nuances that you might have to, you know, even for me, when I went to an interview, maybe, you know, my hair, I would never have it down if I went to an interview because maybe it's too unruly, it's too curly. You don't want to, you know, put people off, if, especially if I'm going to quite a, I want to say like a white office. And then, you know, there are little things that I might do where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be my 100% self obviously you put forward your best self in an interview but I think Queen Mary has so many different groups it's already such a diverse university um if I compare it with another university that my for example, my brother went to uh, Exeter and I like it's just night and day in a completely different like it's so diverse at Queen Mary there is a lot available to anyone who wants to even if you're just a little bit shy you know there are so many people that you can go to to just have any opportunity I think even just being on the mail I got emails constantly like being on their uh, mailbox that is how I ended up uh, being on a full scholarship and living in China for about five years is because one day it just popped up on a mailbox anyone interested in doing this summer summer language course in China and I noticed that they had a, a master's one and I applied for it and then I got in and then I lived in China for five years which is a, a wonderful experience to have had and I think I've learned a lot even as well as Mandarin but I learned a lot of also of different cultures and but I think yeah just there is so much there and I remember even before when I left so last thing what <laughs> before I left I also I had actually this is again with the what who you know I went to a talk, which I think was by the Chamber of Commerce, the German Chamber of Commerce. They came and they had a massive talk about marketing in, and like German businesses in, in the UK. And I remember afterwards, I just, I went up and I spoke to him because I was genuinely interested in what um, the, the man was saying. And he was so impressed that I'd like kind of had the guts to go speak to him. That he was like, oh, here's my card, send me an email. And then we were in, in and they actually did offer me a job, but I ended up going to China so so that never that never like came to fruition but even just I think just little things of just like believing that actually it is you can like yeah you can do it and just going to things that Queen Mary organizes even just like talks like this might give you a bit of motivation and then if they have in-person meetings with people go to them like yeah it is about getting out there that's incredibly encouraging again and may cheered us all up so Nabila do you uh, we are running out of time we've basically got two minutes so um Nabila do you want to say anything about the education side of things and what what universities can do and then maybe Louise uh might wrap up um about academia unfortunately I wish we could talk all night Nabila over to you yeah, so just quickly, what I do want to mention is, um, like Irina said, Kumeri is quite diverse. Um, and what I think lecturers can do is just have a conversation with the students and just let it be out there. I think what one of the hardest thing when it comes to diversity and inclusion is just, it's just not spoken about. Places like universities should create a free space to have those conversations. Um, and ways that um, Kumeri can support students is I think Sadbi is on this call so she set up something called Breakthrough where it's just a safe space for women to speak about the experiences and each week they just have different topics and explore that um, and that was created um, back in I think 2018 um, about struggles that Bangladesh women face when they started their corporate careers so I think Queen Mary are definitely thinking about this but I think more important what that taught me is the relationship that you have with your lecturers or your teachers do go a long way um, and you can students can utilize that and lecturers can utilize that and just educate their children um, children students on 
what it is like out there um, and actually utilize what the university has to offer like breakthrough um, yeah that's what I just wanted to say thank you so much that's so helpful Louise do you want to say anything yeah. about yeah. activist <laughs> academic and then I'll wind up we'll go a couple of yeah. minutes over I would I mean I think it's an amazing question impact am I an academic am I an activist I don't really know and it's good that I don't have time to answer this question although I'd love to because anyone knows me who knows me will know it would turn into a personal therapy session which is probably not one that or nobody needs at this point in the evening so thank you for the question I find it a really hard balance and I'm not sure if I've managed it very well and if whoever answered it wants to talk to me in another forum about this or whoever asked it even I'd be so happy to do that so I'll stop there um, so there were more questions, all of which I've noted down, but I wish I and I wish I could have uh, transmitted them because they're all brilliant, but we've run out of time. Please, panellists, do read the Q&A because there were some things in there which were comments rather than questions. And one is an offer of support, which is so fantastic. So yay for that. Um, so I just want to wrap up by saying... Um, Thank you so much to all of you. You've been absolutely wonderful. And Louise, thank you for your absolutely wonderful book. You've, it's oh, thank just... you so much. Thank you so much, everybody else, and for everyone who came tonight. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to Navila and Ariana and Sophie and Lizzie. Thank you so much.